Welcome everyone to the user group for SSW. Uh, cold, chilly Wednesday night in Melbourne. We've still got a few people here in the in the office in SSW Melbourne. Welcome everybody. Um, tonight we're going to do a topic called education in the cloud. We've got Alexander Candy Levy and Patrick Zhao from SSW to help us present the the uh, talk. So let's get stuck into it. So. Um, Firstly, before we go, we're going to talk about the SSW Rewards app. Now, if you like, you can scan the code there. Um, we are going to give some prizes away I mean SSW points, but we've also got NDC coming up along. So if you come along to NDC, the developer conference, you can actually win, and win some fabulous swag. So very good. So download the SSW Rewards app. So education in the cloud this is about the campion digital journey so i met alexander probably about a year and a half almost two years ago now yep and i i i suppose i personally started the the journey and we're going to give you tonight's talk is a little bit about the journey so we're going to tell a little bit of a story but we're also going to dwell in some of the technical parts of that and we're going to ask alexander and patrick to give us a little bit of background sure so Firstly, about myself, I'm Mike Smedley. I'm the manager of the Melbourne office here in SSW. I, um, I'm a scrum master. I've been around for quite a while. I was the internet and web apps all transfer information to people. I was around when print was around. So that's how old I am. I was going to do a joke <laughs> then, but I won't do any, any jokes tonight. Um, Oh, you don't need it, Mike. Uh, I'm, I'm Alexander Candy-Levy, so I'm the web development manager at uh, Campion Education. So obviously uh, we're here to talk tonight about our journey to digital and um, what we've been able to do with our new platform, MyConnect2. And we can tell Alexander is specialised on a lot of technologies and services on Azure. That's why we come together and build this um, whole, whole app. Um, I'm Patrick Zhao. I'm a solution architect at SSW. Um, I specialize on Azure, and over the years, I design, um, build, deliver uh, solutions for my clients. I believe that the best solution is the solution that can help my clients to remove their pain point in their digital journey and also empower their business. All right, so what we're going to do tonight is, firstly, uh, we've done, uh, we're going to talk about the complexity in the cloud. There's a fair bit of complexity in education, which I wasn't aware of when we started this journey. Um, we're going to dwell on three main topics. Firstly, authentication and integration and how much <laughs> how much pain is there for you guys. And we're going to actually yep. dwell on some of the ways Alexander and his team have, have solved some of those problems. Secondly, we're going to talk about microservices, which is a big part of the system that SSW helped these guys build. And the last part, which is Patrick's going to help us with, is about the infrastructure, which is DevOps, uh, application management, and some, some stuff to do with the cost as well. Um, thank you very much. All right, let's talk about the journey. So a couple of years ago, it's fair to say that Campion Education uh, was and still is the biggest uh, educational school book distributor in Australia. Yep. Have been, it's a family business that's been going for, gosh, uh, yeah, well over 25 years now. 25 years. And still, when I met you guys, probably even though it was, what, 2019, 20... Yep. So you'd think in 2019, you'd still you'd think that a lot of people would be reading books uh, digitally, but that's not the case. Back in that day, you were about 17, 18% of all the school kids on your platform, and which is about 70% of um, market share across Australia, yep. that uh, that only about 17, 18% of the school children was, were using an e-reader platform. And Campion Education had sourced an e-reader platform from overseas. Mm. Now, the problem, when they started that journey, they were the only client, but when it came to sort of 2018 and 2019, when the kids started to adopt the digital reader, they wanted to start to take control of their own destiny. Uh, you were one of many people, and obviously with big markets like the US and Europe, the app and its direction and some of the nuances of the Australian market for um, uh, the children in Australia and some of the ways that the education system worked here didn't suit the way the app was built. 
No, um, certainly uh, there, were, there were a lot of delays. Um, you know, uh, we work very, very closely with our schools, Michael, and we want to get things out in front of them as quickly as possible. And for a school, you know, they come to us and say, can we do X, can we do Y, can we do Z? Um, we want to give them that as quickly as possible. And that could be, you know, in an ideal world, you know, one or two weeks, um, you know, we can get that to market now. Whereas uh, back on our old platform, we were limited to four deployments a year. So during school holidays. Um, so, yeah, we had, we had a lot of, lot of pain points around that for sure. And so the decision was taken to take uh, control of their own destiny and build their own e-reader platform. And um, I'm sure we're all aware of there's a lot of uh, e-reader platforms on the planet, but there's a fair bit more complexity, especially when you're dealing with many, many different publishers uh, mm -hmm. and also a really, really interesting ecosystem of schools across Australia with different states and territories and different uh, groups, you've got different religious bodies that have got different ways of doing things. So, Campion Education decided to build their own. SSW came along to help. And the first thing we want to talk about maybe is a little bit of the methodology that we used. So, obviously, Agile. Yeah. So, obviously, when you're only doing four deployments a year, it becomes really difficult to be agile, to be quick. So, you know, this is really old school. You know, we'd put in a, we'd put in a work order, we'd get it signed off. We'd go through, um, you know, a few months later, we'd, we'd get it. And then if we were happy with it, we could then deploy it over the holidays. That doesn't work. Um, you know, we've got a very large percentage of the market share. So that means we have a lot of unique requirements right across the education landscape. Releasing four times a year doesn't cut it uh, pretty much. And, you know, a big thing for us really is customization um, beyond and above everything else that we can do for a school. So uh, a lot of that ends up coming down to things that we maybe don't think need customization initially. Well, you go live and you find out that we do. Yeah. So let's talk about what sort of backs that up the DevOps. Um, Cloud Native and Azure, which we've got listed there. You want to talk a little bit more about how that played in to be able to release? Yeah, so when, we, when we've got a, an, an application, a system as big as My Connect is, um, there's a lot of inbuilt complexity in it, Michael. So a big thing for us is, you know, we're, we're a pretty small team at Campion. We do a lot with fairly little. So because of that, we've needed to, uh, we need to automate pretty much everything. So that's where DevOps, Azure really comes into play because we don't want to be thinking about our infrastructure. We don't want to be thinking about, oh, we need to do a deployment. I don't want to be up at 4 a.m. doing a deployment um, outside of hours or anything like that. So a big thing for us right from the start was let's get it cloud native. Let's get it right. So, uh, you know, long term, we can look at doing continuous integration, continuous deployment, you know, it's a, and, you know, zero downtime, all that really good stuff. Let's talk about the tech stack that was used to, because, um, I think we should have probably said this earlier, but the system that we uh, were, uh, it, the original system was called MyConnect. Yep. And this is now MyConnect 2. Yes. So if we, we use that term in the future, you'll know what we're talking about. What was the decision about the tech stack? So, uh, you know, the old platform, um, our least platform was, a, it was actually, it was, it was hosted on AWS. But because we were sort of leasing it white labeled, um, you know, we just had that very static cost. Um, and we're a very cyclic company. You know, we do 95% of our business over two months of the year. And students uh, all decide to get online at 9 a.m. on a Monday for some reason on the first day of term. I can't tell you why. <laughs> um, but no, so a really big thing for us was being able to scale and scale effectively. Um, so we looked at a whole bunch of different technology. We are a bit, you know, we're a bit more traditional in that. We're, we're a Microsoft shop um, at Campium with our development team mm -hmm. um, but you know we do have node.js applications running around and all sorts of weird and wonderful things getting around and so we kind of looked at what was out there um, and knowing that we wanted to go to cloud we wanted to pick technology that was going to be a first class citizen and was just going to work for us out of the box so .NET ticks all those boxes Microsoft are putting so much more love and attention onto it these days as well so you know even just going you know, when we started this I think we started on .NET Core 3.1 mm -hmm to five and now we're on six and every time we do an upgrade um the performance gets better and better and angular 13 we get some really good wins out of that as well uh just being able to scale that in terms of having a really good front-end app that feels really really well put together um with a lot of defined uh use cases okay great yeah so and being a first class um uh, language on azure the um upgrading uh, experience from dynamics 3.1 to dynamics 5 to dynamics 6 was smooth and easy very smooth very good. 
Very good. So let's talk about the adoption because um, effectively this is an e-reader platform. So, And uh, as someone like myself and Patrick who was involved with Camping Education, we knew that a lot of the complexity was behind the scenes. The students use an e-reader platform, but that all that complexity behind the scenes. So let's let's start on the adoption across the Australian schools. Yeah, so as you were touched on before, we're probably at about 17% of um, the user base who actually use the digital or were using the old digital reader platform, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, that's good, not great. Uh, mm -hmm. We, You know, I'm, I'm in the development team, so I want everyone to use it, obviously. Um, so, you know, we really approach it from uh, a big thing for us is really making the school life easier. Um, so, you know, if you look at our old platform, licensing in it was a pain. You know, sometimes to get a student set up could take a day, two days. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something in a new platform, you know, that takes seconds now, less than a minute to, you know, if I want to set up 500 users, get them all wow. set up with 30 licenses each, it's very, very quick. So from a school perspective or from a camp perspective, we're able to do things a lot quicker in our new platform which translates to doing things a lot quicker for schools as well. So as a result of that, we're seeing more and more schools jumping on board our platform saying, we'd love to try it out. Um, you know, being able to just set up a demo for a school in about three minutes and, you know, within the three minutes I can have, we can have a school created, its own custom subdomain, it's got SSO turned on and we've got 500 users set up with books all in about all in under five minutes. So oh, wow. that is something we would definitely could not do <laughs> yeah. on the old platform. Yeah, because you've got a big customer service team that uh, that answers and helps a lot of the your clients. So I imagine it made their life a lot easier. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, definitely one of the complexities there sort of exists in education and not necessarily so much if you look at, say, UK or US markets, but certainly within Australia, Every school does sort of everything on their own unless they're sort of seeing it or something something like that. Mm. Um, they're pretty much doing everything their own way. So what that means is every school has their own unique set of requirements about mm -hmm. how they specifically do things. And um, sometimes it can be hard, you know, as, as, a, as a techie, as a developer, I want to walk in there and say, well, let's just come up with a standard and let's all, let's all listen to that standard. Uh, but, that's, you know, sometimes trying to convince um, a seven-year-old Edna who works in admin uh, at the school that she needs now needs to change her process after 50 years. Mm. That doesn't always go over that well. So one thing that's going to really entice new users and new students into this is the immersive experience because obviously the great thing about a textbook, the old school textbook, is it, it never the, the power, power problems never, <laughs> never. But you've really got to pull them in with an immersive experience and start to give them new medias and this collaboration between teachers and students. Yep, yep. So talk to, to, talk to that a little. Yeah, so a really big focus for uh, MyConnect2 was making sure the platform was immersive as, as we can make it. So that means things like, uh, you know, we've got immersive reader built in for all those students who have any disabilities or any issues reading, or if you want to read it in another language, all that's supported out of the box. Uh, Real-time collaboration between students and teachers. Um, so as a teacher, you can be in class, you can write your notes or you can share them straight away, you can share them overnight and have them, you know, pop up in class or whatever. So from that perspective, it really means that we can, you know, uh, from a student's perspective, if you're reading your textbook, you shouldn't need to be jumping out and jumping left, right and center because, um, you know, the worst thing you can probably do for a student if they're on a laptop or an iPad is go, can you just switch to this other app or can you just go look at this other section real quick? Because what you're going to do is when you get out of that, they go, oh, there's my Facebook notification. Let me just have a real quick look at that. So the more we, can, the more functionality we build into the platform, the more useful we can make it, not only for teachers but also for students, the more engagement we're going to get. And I know that's uh, we're going to end on some of the stuff that's coming down the pipe, which will be yep, yep. interesting. So obviously cross-platform is really important with uh, some students with iPhone 6s and all sorts of different devices. Also, So you guys would have a fair few headaches supporting a lot of devices and browsers and the like, I'm guessing. Yeah, so one of the things we get from schools is school. some schools want everything via a browser, some want apps, some want a real mix. Um, so we have to go out there and provide everything. So whether it's mobile, desktop or on the web, um, we're out there, we're supporting them. So let's deep dive in some of the tech. So... So let's maybe go to uh, talk about the ecosystem. Yeah, so, yeah, so our, our ecosystem is pretty big and it's pretty complex. And this is really what you're seeing here right now um, is really just a subset of some of the stuff that sits around MyConnect2 explicitly. There's a whole bunch of other systems that also sit on the back end that support feeding data uh, and users all in into this system. 
Um, so a big thing for us is, you know, we have a lot of integration, not only with schools, but also with publishers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, every day we're pulling data from schools and we're integrating that into our system. Every day we're automatically talking to publishers and setting up user accounts. So one of the nice things we like to be able to say is uh, Timmy comes in and this can sometimes happen at a public school where um, Timmy comes in and the school doesn't know Timmy's uh, now registered and he's now learning it at school. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're able to do, um, you know, if the school's got all their auto imports and everything set up is... He can come into school. By the time he's in class, even though the school's only found out about it at 8.30 in the morning, by the time at 9 a.m. hits and he's in class, he's got all of his accounts set up through Campion and all of his accounts set up through publishers. So he already has all of his licensed content waiting for him, ready to go in. Authentication, and I, I, we're sort of going to start to really delve into that a little bit more because I was just blown away when I found out how many different systems you guys have to support and the whole... Mm. way not only publishers students teachers different school systems some schools are very advanced some schools are really quite behind and you guys have got almost set up an end of the authentication so the student journey is really seamless but behind the scenes there's so many headaches i'm guessing yeah so we've essentially you know we're talking about microservices and this maybe isn't such a microservice as a macro service <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day um there is a lot of complexity in our authentication story. So, uh, you know, everyone, everyone who's using our system has a Campion account. They log into all of our internal, our, all of our external systems mm -hmm. like that. Um, of course, we integrate with all the publishers as well. So every student at every school that we work with, their Campion account can be used to log in at, their, at publishers. So um, when we're saying publishers, uh, I probably should expand on that a little bit. A lot of publishers, if you have a look at Oxford or Cengage or Cambridge, mm -hmm. um, they'll have like interactive versions of their te textbooks often. They might have homework assignments or other things that they're doing in those platforms or even other subscription services and other third parties that we work with and partners that we work with. Mm -hmm. So as a, as, a, as, a user of, uh, as a user of Campion, mm -hmm. I have, depending on how the school's set up, um, but I, I will only ever have one username and one password. Um, and that, that's regardless of how the school set up. If the school is set up using, you know, SSO, we can do a lot of really cool things. We, you know, we send them back to the school to do to do their authentication story. Some of the really good wins we get out of that is from a, from a school perspective, they do one setup with us and they've got access not only to all of our systems, but, you know, 30 publisher and third party systems as well in one hit. And, you know, depending on what they're using, if they're using Office 365, if they're using G Suite, they actually don't even need to do any setup. Wow. Um, it's literally we, we click a button on our end and off it goes. This um, single sign-on uh, mechanism really empowers your user experience. That's great. Is there anything special uh, in education um, industry in terms of the, the single sign-on or authentication protocol? Yeah, so you'll see it here on this slide, LTI, the Learning Tool Interoperability Framework. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, so LTI is this really, uh, really intense protocol that sits in between system that essentially allows uh, education systems to really, really tightly integrate. And we've got a video on that that, that we'll go into in a little bit. Um, but basically, while you're a, a student, so let's say you're a student you're using something like Canvas, which is an LMS system, mm -hmm. um, our entire MyConnect2 platform can be embedded straight into that mm -hmm. platform. So, oh, right. um, you know, from there, you can say, if you're saying, if you're a teacher, you're saying, hey, look at this book, that book, this book, you can say, you know, as part of that, you can say, well, click here to open up that book on this specific link. And it all sits there. You know, you're not even going into a new tab or anything like that. It's all within that one screen to just straight away, you're in your textbook exactly where you need to be. Wow, wow great. Let's have a look at the seamless um, experience. So what the user is doing is that they're logging the system by mm. putting in a username and password. But let's just uh, point out that that's Canvas. This is not... My Connect. This is a, another education system that My Connect is living inside of. Yeah. So wow. this student, uh, Peter, who's, who's logged in, as soon as he's logged in, he's clicked on My Connect, and you can see all of his books are straight up there. He didn't have yeah. to log in a second time or anything like that. It's all just there, and you can also say there's a bit of a quick demo of uh, My Connect Two as well in uh, in here. There's sort of lots of different modes, <laughs> um, but yeah, the full functionality of My Connect Two is available in here. So, which is some really powerful stuff. And this system, I know a lot of uh, schools use the Canvas system to manage students and manage courses and marks and calendars and teacher assignments. So without yeah. uh, a seamless integration between the two systems means that authentication just happens seamlessly. Yeah. yeah, they don't have to think about it. Yeah, well, fabulous. Wow, that's 
that's great. And well, embedded such a, a huge enterprise application, a reader platform into another system is a, a lot of a job. And but with this experience, um, students can have a better, you know, learning. They can focus on on this platform. They don't need to jump out to check their Facebook <laughs> notification anymore. Absolutely. Oh, that's great. So let's talk. Let's go deep dive a little bit, Alexander. So uh, I like to describe our we call it IAM identity and access management. It's a uh, it's a distribution platform for other mm -hmm. systems. So as a company, we're a distributor of school books, physical and digital. Um, and IAM is our is sort of a backbone here that allows us to distribute um, connectivity into other systems, whether it's our own systems, whether it's publishers or school systems. So. If you're not familiar with um, SSO protocols, there's sort of a quick diagram here and it sort of goes through. I won't, won't talk through it. Single sign-on. Single sign-on. I won't yes. talk through it too, too explicitly. Um, but pretty much at the end of the day, the way our system works, it really sits there in the middle. So for a publisher and for our own systems, um, we act as the identity provider. And for a school, we actually act as the resource provider. And we've got a whole bunch of other things built in there, a whole bunch of smarts built in there. So... There's a very, very good likelihood. If you're if you're a student at a school, you click on one button. Um, if the school is set up with uh, Office 365 or uh, Azure AD Connect or their ADFS system, um, and they're doing SSO through that way, they'll or because they're already federated on their Windows machine in their school environment, they'll literally click Connect, and they don't have to type in a password or a username or anything. They're literally just straight into the system. Nice, wow. nice, wow. So this this uh, I am I, I guess this complexity um this is uh, in house developed and, yeah uh, you support a lot of different protocols and mechanisms yeah wow. so we support all the big ones SAML OAuth two OpenID Connect wow. um, and we're able to translate between all those different protocols so a school can connect in with us with one way um, and publishers can connect in with us another way and we'll make that do that translation for them oh, so from a publisher point of view they do one connection with us. And now they're set up with a thousand schools, you know, straight away, um, which is which is some pretty powerful stuff. You guys have got over over three thousand schools on on the system generally as clients. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's there's quite a few schools roaming around these days. Wow. Um, wow. And and <laughs> and that uh, it's only going to grow over time as pe as people transfer away from paper books onto digital. So this these uh, so we're going to start to talk about how you handle all this volume of data and traffic. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So. Is a diagram? Just yeah. A bit of, uh... So, yeah, this, this is a really quick example of kind of how that authentication pipeline within IAM works. So sort of on that right-hand side there, you can see uh, connecting in with both MyConnect2 and the rest of our internal systems as well as publishers. And there on the left, um, communicating with, uh, with schools. So yeah, we also have username and password support. Um, so for schools that actually don't have SSO, will be their identity provider and we will do SSO on their behalf to all the publishers and all of our own systems. Right. So the flexibility of IAM is that uh, we can be both identity provider as well as consumer to some other third-party providers. So yep. that really gives uh, your users a lot of options there. Oh, for sure. Cool. All right. So how do we do all of this? So 9 a.m. Monday morning, when it was at February 3rd or something like that, yep. that, that this system went live. Uh, so obviously it was a bit of a slow uptake, but uh, in 2023... Mm -hmm. It, you're upwards, I think there's like 4.3 available school students in mm -hmm. Australia and that's growing all the time. Yeah. And if you guys are 70 plus percent market share, gosh, that would be on next 2023, you're going to have upwards of you know almost a million students lo logging on as your market share grows. Yep. How the heck do you uh, make it run at speed? Yeah, so when we when we uh, initially, uh, uh, John, when we as a W initially um, got um, hired by uh, Campin. One of the, the biggest um, challenge or problem is this seasonal scaling. So as we we'll probably know, since the, the pandemic, the online teaching or online learning experience has become a new norm um, in this in, in this uh, period of time. So we really want to um, be able to scale up and scale out our server as well as databases, data stores, file stores, um, to be able to handle this uh, amount of traffic, this spike, mm -hmm. but we also don't want to waste our money. Uh, we want to be able to scale back in and scale down uh, when there are not that many uh, active users logging in because, mind you, we we, we um, keep the user session uh, on the client. We cache uh, some of the books, which we'll, uh, we'll dive into those um, uh, technical details uh, later. But um, in order to do it, we really uh, leverage some of um, 
the cool services um, Azure offers, such as the um, uh, premium app service plan scale out and scale back in uh, mechanism, which we've got a screenshot here um, that we can see. So based on the matrix, um, if the, the uh, memory usage or the, uh, the CPU usage is um, over a certain amount, we're going to scale the instances out. And uh, uh, when it's back to, to normal, we're going to scale back in. So that's, uh, it doesn't uh, cost us uh, extra money. Mm -hmm. um, go back. And uh, with the C uh, we hosted our databases, a couple of um, um, other single databases on Elastic Pool, which gives us the flexible uh, elasticity and scalability. And with um, the non-relational data, we've chosen um, Cosmos DB. Mm -hmm. um, and Cosmos DB has its flexible way to uh, scale up and scale out. Uh, when the, there's a spike, uh, it's going to uh, uh, scale up uh, to allocate more RU, rewrite units, mm -hmm. um, which, which this serverless fashion really empowers um, our uh, platform, but also keep our cost um, as low as possible. Um, there's a special uh, functionality within MC2, which is a, a real-time push notification. As we mentioned before, we want students and teachers to collaborate and have a, a, like a shared learning experience. Um, that's, that's done uh, via a WebSocket connection. Um, traditionally, with, with .NET developers, we're going to choose uh, Signal as a default go-to library, uh, mm -hmm. which, which is really cool and awesome. Um, but the problem with that is that we have to host the Signal Hub ourselves. Um, and so that's um, developers need to do a lot of uh, work, uh, plumbing to make sure that it can be, uh, the server side can be scaled properly. Um, Azure has this signal service, which is a managed service and it does handle the scale for us, which is neat. We just in, in, the, in our program model, we cho we've chosen um, the serverless hub, serverless hub on um, Azure function, which gives us this flexibility for the mm -hmm. scaling. And uh, it's already on the roadmap that uh, we're going to containerize all our applications. So that opens the door to a lot of options for a, even a better uh, scaling story. We, we are considering Azure Container Apps, which was released like half a year ago uh, as GA. And we are, we are, once we've got our apps all containerized, we can consider to host uh, spin up our own Kubernetes um, cluster on Azure uh, using Azure AKS service. And that gives us a lot of flexibility um, to manage this uh, scaling story. Because if uh, you guys ever expand overseas, that's going to help your expansion, isn't it? Uh, yeah, for sure. And yeah, it's something very hard to do on a traditional <laughs> yeah. uh, server setup. Yeah, the infrastructure is really important to, to growing, isn't it? Yep. Yeah. So let's talk about the microservices and how you split the app up. Yeah, so really MC2 is an enterprise application. So we uh, came from a off-the-shelf application, which is huge, and it has a lot of features, functions. Um, we, we like to talk about domain-driven design. What it's really about is how we model uh, the domain into uh, organize them into different submodules, um, and then so that we can explain how a system work um, as bits and pieces and how they're bolted up uh, to a, a, in a layman's work. Um, but however, when we are going actually uh, get out, get into the transition, uh, we want to keep the old system up and running or in the meantime, we build a new system. Although the new system, the, the bits and pieces we are building uh, is on a UIT or stage environment, but at least we want to give user an, an inter integrated, um, inter integral uh, experience so that uh, the, um, the user can test the functionality out thoroughly. So uh, we we had utilized a, a, a development approach or a design pattern called strangler fit pattern, uh, which, um, which I've got a, a photo to show in the next few slides. Um, it's like the, the, the strangler tree, how it um, slowly uh, wrap up the trunk and then uh, uh, strangle the, the trunk out and then which become a, a new new tree. <laughs> um, so uh, along with this modular approach, we've um, uh, grouped the uh, entire system to different modules. Um, Alexander can uh, tell us more about it, how we group them. And, and then we um, um, migrate module by module. Uh, while we're migrating, we keep the old system running, but we just sort of have an API gateway sitting as a, like a facade which communicates with front end, and then we point those uh, newly, developed, newly developed module to the new system. Yep. So how was the experience from your management, your team you know, scrum mastering uh, you know, yep, perspective? Yep. It, was, uh, it was far less painless than some other projects I've done, that's for sure. 
Um, oh, so one of the real benefits we got out of uh, using this strangler pattern was the ability that I think we had a working prototype, I think, within a month, yeah. I think it was. Yeah. Um, and so we were able to have users go in, get testing, get feedback very, very quickly, very, very early. Yeah. Um, so we kind of really perfected the, the user story of how the front end, um, how, the, how the actual reader platform works. Mm -hmm. um, and then once we were really happy with all that, we were then able to then start looking at sort of the, the admin side of stuff, user management, yeah. licensing, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, for those first few months, we were just you know, relying on the old platform to do that. Um, but I mean, we could get all that feedback in very, very quickly and just replace it slowly over time. That was great. I imagine the licensing is fairly complicated because I understand that there's a lot of publishers in the ecosystem mm -hmm. and because of schools, it's not just as simple as buying a book and being able to read a book. It's also they there's some freebies, there's some, hey, you can have 30-day trial and you yeah. can have this and I'm withdrawing that and the teacher is allowed you to have this. It must be that API must be hit like crazy. And it's changing all the time. It's changing. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah four or five different ways we do licensing. You know, it's basic user licensing where they've paid for it, or where their schools paid for it, or school bulk licensing, or demo books, or trial books, or and every, everything in between. Um, there's even a few more, a few more ways of licensing coming. I think at the moment we're adding about a million licenses every week um, onto wow. the platform, and that's not really having any user growth. You know, sort of throughout the year, that's just how many new licenses are sort of adding sort of week in, week out, as a school says, oh, can we try this? Can we look at this? Oh, let's grab that. And um, I suppose the the microservice and the, the strangler pattern has allowed you to start to uh, um, segment that out, yeah. work on things, make sure that you can, uh, if something breaks over here, it doesn't break over there. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it really, really it's, it's been really good. It also lets us make sure our microservices do one thing and they do it really, really well. Um, so licensing, for example, so, you know, we, we use Cosmos behind the scenes to actually do all that because we have so much data sitting in there. We have a very specific use case of how we read that data out and when we write it in. 99% mm -hmm. of the usage is I have one user, get me all their licensing information. Um, that's 99% of the use case. So, you know, do the same thing in SQL. Sometimes those calls could take, you know, 20 or 30 seconds depending on how, you know, you potentially had your database configured with that many records. In Cosmos, that same query for that one user to get all 30 of their licenses. It's 30 milliseconds, it's super quick. Um, so it means the actual microservice itself is actually, it's not actually doing all that much work. Cosmos is handling all the all the smarts and all the scaling for us. Wow, yeah. very cool. Yeah, so in, in reality, um, each family has their own, uh, you know, finance uh, situation. So they might have different expectations or requirements for licensing model, um, money related. So while we are working on uh, enhancing and uh, Extending the license module, we would then uh, affect other parts of the system. That's yeah. uh, one one big benefit of uh, mm -hmm. microservice um, architecture. So, if we look at the um, transitioning um, process, although it's like a twenty months or twenty more twenty plus months process, so we started from I, I like a very simple dice. So it could be built from a um, tens of thousands of lines of code, um, but um, this this is a one single um, huge system. So we started. Um, uh, slicing that, uh, them to different uh, modules, grouping them um, based on their business domains. Mm -hmm. Although they're still in a, in a big system, but uh, we make um, uh, us, ourselves clearer about what each part does and how they uh, bolt it up. Although they are not actually um, separated out. But um, uh, the, the last step was to actually uh, break them down to um, different uh, Lego bricks. Well, then we can put them up um, as, a, as an entire uh, a Ruby cube. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this is a good example of the strangulific pattern, as you probably can see. Uh, while the, the trunk of the tree is still there, the um, uh, strangler tree will slowly wrap up the, the trunk and then, then strangle the, the, the gut of it out. And then it becomes a new new system, new tree, which has more flexibility mm -hmm. um, and doesn't affect the, well, at least from a user perspective, when you look from outside words, it's still the tree there. Um, yeah, so this experience is really good and enjoyable. And um, we've learned a lot front end, and then we're sharing our knowledge here, here today. Fabulous, great stuff, guys. Um, so we're going to talk about infrastructure, which I know um, uh, is a big thing for you guys. Um, obviously, it's a SaaS-based application yeah. that you had no control over. Now you can, now you can uh, release a new version a couple of times a week if, if that's what you want to do. So tell us all about that. Yeah. So uh, obviously, with with the old model, because it was a licensing, you know, we just paid that licensing cost. Um, you know, day in, day out. And, um, you know, 
they kind of look at it and, you know, as any software as a service company is going to do, they go, well, what's the maximum expectation? How much are they going to spend? And, well, we'll pay a bit more than that. Um, so it meant that we're essentially paying for that capacity all year round. Um, whereas now, you know, we're able to scale to two or three instances up and down um, as required. So we've taken a really, uh, we're, we're in the situation where when we scale, we scale quite hard and quite early. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're in the situation where all those students are all trying to jump in at the same time. Some systems, you know, will scale up, you know, okay, 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. sort of gradually increases. And at 10 a.m., you know, we need to add some more services and it's sort of a bit linear. We're sort of in five minutes, we've gone from zero to 100. <laughs> um, so I don't I know Patrick had the screenshot up there earlier, but um, we've taken a, a, an approach, you know, scale early and scale hard. Um, so, which is re- really good because it means that from a student, from a teacher point of view, the system's always really performant regardless of what time of day you jump on. And that's where SQL Cosmos, they can scale super easily there as well. So, you know, especially with SQL, being able to share those resources um, between all those different microservices is a major uh, cost cutting exercise for us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it just, just licensing a normal SQL server can be quite expensive. So to be able to grab that, stretch it out, stretch all those resources out is very, very handy. Um, and a big thing for us, uh, you know, we're dealing with a lot of textbooks, a lot of files. Mm-hmm. Um, we're a very data intensive wow. platform. Mm-hmm. How big um, is each book? Like the PDF? You y- yeah. So the, I think the biggest book I saw was in the realm of 1.6 gig. Um, wow. Now, if you've got a textbook 1.6 gig in file size, no one's going to wait around to download that to read that on their laptop. No, no, no. Um, so it's where, you know, we've worked with a tool called PDF Trom, um, where they've got some really cool things in there where, you know, that's, I saw that same textbook that got shrunk down to about 80 megabytes in size yeah, wow. in terms of raw file savings. That's huge. And the other thing we really took a, took to heart was making offline um, a first class citizen. So everything we did from day zero was how do we make this work offline? How do we make this work offline? Um, there's two reasons for that. One, not everyone always ha- is online all of the time. And two, um, but having things offline, things load quicker and we don't have to spend all that money on bandwidth. Um, I think in the first two weeks after we went live, um, there was something, it was around the realm of 1.5 terabytes um, of data that we sent down to students in those first two weeks. Um, in the two weeks following, it was about 200 gig. So that offline caching, if you just look at the amount we saved just in terms of networking costs, yeah, it was five times higher for two weeks in Feb and then yeah, 20% for those other two weeks. Mm. Really good wow. win. Wow. Amazing. So that would, uh, I'll bet, uh, save the boss a couple of dollars along the journey? I've been trying to argue for a margarita <laughs> machine, but it's not happening. <laughs> yes, yeah, very, very good. But also, I was, I was thinking as well with uh, all the students, you'd know uh, which, which schools sleep in because the, they won't be loading data as fast, I'm guessing. Yep, yep. All right, so let's talk about the infrastructure. Um, Pat, um, oh, not Patrick, um, and the DevOps processes. Yeah, so as I said earlier, we're a pretty small team um, internally. Mm-hmm. So, and none of us want to be up at 4 a.m. doing deployments. So yeah. a big thing for us was, automating everything so uh everything to do with getting that code deploying it um even testing it it's all automated um you know we're not we don't have enough people in the team to sit around for 20 hours every week doing testing so mm. we spend a lot of time building automated tests mm-hmm. they run on every pull request um That's great. yeah uh, patrick can probably talk about some of the infrastructure uh, as code stuff there as well yeah 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 uh we use the plumi so when we talk about infrastructure as code, uh, people usually refer to um, uh, uh, tools and open source uh, tools or, or libraries like uh, Terraform or even on Azure that they have uh, ARM templates or um, bicep. They're all cool. There's nothing wrong. Uh, we've chosen a Plumi because uh, with Plumi we can um, uh, code in different languages that have good uh, support for both uh, TypeScript, JavaScript, Node.js, or uh, C Sharp, and a couple of other uh, languages. You can code your infrastructure uh, in a procedure way. Uh, rather than a, um, a tr- like like ARM template, which is a declarative language like JSON or YAML, um, so that way um, it gives us because um, the development shop and uh, the uh, skill sets that are in Campion's uh, development team is more from a, a C sharp background or Node.js background. They can uh, easily pick those code up uh, and maintain it. Um, and at the end of the day, DevOps is about people, process, and products. We never want to repeat ourselves. 
don't repeat yourself. We want to auto automate everything. Um, and with those pipelines, we, uh, we pretty much um, leverage all the features on Azure DevOps. Um, uh, it allows us to do uh, deployment, redeployment, where anything goes wrong in any environment. Um, and we are able to set up all those approval process. So um, the, the managers can, can approve a release when they're ready to announce to the schools. Yeah, so, and also we've got a, an awesome um, DevOps story for the cross-platform application support. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got a, a very um, robust and comprehensive setup for Electron um, that can be released both on Windows and, uh, and Mac. Um, and it also supports uh, the beta mode. So when users want to try out some new features, they can turn on beta mode, which may open a can of wood. <laughs> um, but but they can they can choose to try it. They can always delete and fall back, which is easy and flexible. Um, and also uh, iOS, we can easily push to uh, test flights and get a, a group of um, QA mm -hmm. or BI to test for us and get mm -hmm. early feedback. And then once everything is ready, um, the delivery manager can um, draft out a, a formal release and push to App Store. Those all are, are all set up. Um, so from a development uh, manager or Scrum Master's perspective, it's really easy for him to manage the roadmap and development process. So those of us with children out there, when should we not be logging on? When do you actually push out a new version generally? Uh, depends on the weekday. Oh. Um, so we, we look at the stats uh, as we go throughout the year and whatever time sort of slot has the least. I mean, because it's so well automated, um, each microservice behind the scenes is probably only unavailable for 15 to 20 seconds oh, anyway. Cool. So cool. you, we could probably release a 3 p.m. in the afternoon and you might have 0.1% of people notice. Plus, because of the amount of stuff that's cached, on, on people's devices, especially, you're yeah. only really handling then the people that yeah. need to either re-download a new book or, so yeah. It must... and that's where Azure DevOps comes in really handy because, you know, obviously we've got three different environments. We've got Windows, Mac, iOS, and, and the web apps all going out. So there's a whole bunch of different deployment targets here, right. um, whole load of uh, microservices there. So it's gotten to the point now where, you know, we want to do a release. Okay, we create a tag on the on, on the um, on a commit, um, and that creates a, our build artifacts for that version. Um, that goes out to the dev environment automatically. We can then, some point later, once we're happy with that, we haven't broken anything uh, too much. Uh, we'll push it out to staging for for further feedback and testing. Mm -hmm. um, once we incorporate all that feedback and testing, then we can push that in and prod. And it's really just a few button clicks to get that out. And what's really really cool is. I'm here at, on, you know, no one likes to do a deployment at 5 p.m. on a Friday. Um, so I can sit here and go, well, it's 5 p.m. on a Friday. I'm going to schedule my deployment to go out 4 a.m. Monday morning. Yep. Um, so at least that way, if there's anything does go wrong, uh, I'll be in early enough to uh, resolve any issues. Good plan. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't, re don't deploy Friday <laughs> afternoon because the boss is ringing you Friday night going, something's broken. <laughs> All right. Hi. Yep. Still did some stats. Yeah, so um, we've got a really clear usage pattern, sort of the next one as well, that in terms of you can see these, we've got these really big spikes, those two sort of lower days there, that was over the weekend. Mm -hmm. um, so and sort of different hours throughout the day. So you can see we've got a really strong use case, uh, really, a lot of users going on in the morning. Um, we've got some users on in the afternoon. Predominantly, it's WA users on in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, morning their time. And then at night time, there's not that much going on in the system. Right. Uh, Maybe there's just not that much. So where did, where did we get these stats from? These all came straight out of Azure, oh, out of uh, App Insight. So all of the microservices, the API gateway, oh. um, front end, everything hooks back into uh, Azure App Insight. So we've got visibility right across everything. So sure. if we see a failure, we can track it down, see every single microservice that was that was impacted. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, here you can again, you can see a really clear usage uh, usage pattern here. Um, you can even see there where we're spiking up uh, pretty well every day, going up to at least two instances. Mm. Um, we've got this really uh, intense syncing process that happens about 6 a.m. every morning at the moment. So uh, even on weekends, you'll usually see uh, it spike up. Mm. Um, and you know we're able to sync almost yeah, a million users to the system in wow. probably 20 minutes because wow. we're just able to scale it up and process it that quickly. Did I see in a previous slide about 1.2 million at one point in time there, almost? Um, yeah, almost 12 million requests over that, that wow. week. Just, yeah. Very, very good. Cool. Very, very cool. And, and it didn't kill our app. 
<laughs> we're scaled um, pretty, pretty, pretty uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's obviously right. points to how well built it is yeah. under, the, under the hood. So mm -hmm. very nice. And these are all running on a television in, in the office, aren't they? Yeah, so yeah. So we, we, we actually um, internally, we, we actually don't have, we've got the dashboard set up in App Insights for when we're on our laptops and things like that. In the office, we actually grab all that data and we actually then pump it through Grafana. Wow. Because um, then we have, we have a whole bunch of other systems that also feed into our Grafana mm -hmm. dashboard. So you could be sitting there in the office and we've got full, visit visit full visibility of all the instances we've got running and what sort of load we're under and mm. if there's any concerns and sort of what our error rates are and everything like that. Nice. Really, really APM nice. is getting more and more important and is essential in enterprise applications, especially you have different uh, mm. moving parts and we can see from one of the previous slides about describing the ecosystem. They've got such a huge system and they are all interconnected. A proper uh, APM with the correlation with the um, overarching metric can help them to make decisions um, mm. proactively. I suppose if you're waiting for customer service to tap you on the shoulder telling you something's wrong, that's probably <laughs> that's, that's, not the right way of doing it. It's too late. <laughs> yeah, it's too late. All right. So, yeah, this is just a really quick example of uh, some of the releases that we've been doing. So, yeah, we did three releases just here at the start of June in that in that first week, which is it would not have been doable um, in, in the old system at all. So this is specifically here for the API gateway. So you can see here. We've gone to dev, staging, and prod, and we've got all the logs to us to tell us mm. when all those things went out, which is which mm. is really handy. If we want to roll back, um, so we can actually see here release 108 and 109. Mm -hmm. um, 108, we released the dev environment, and um, it wasn't so stable. So we fixed it. We did release 109, and that was stable. We pushed it to staging, and then we got some good feedback, and uh, we thought we better not release this into production. We'll, we'll hold back, and we'll, we'll do a new version. And right. once we got that out, yep, that was all approved out into production at I'm not sure. That, you know, it would have been four in the morning um, on a Monday. Yes, very nice. Wow. Only, the, only those children uh, on a yacht in the um, in the French Riviera would be logging on <laughs> to the time zone. Cool. What's next? Tell us about where you guys are going with this app. Well, we're already in a place where the experience compared to our old platform is significantly better. So we're only looking at improving that. Mm -hmm. um, so a really big thing for us is deeper integration with other LMSs. Um, so whether that's Canvas or Sector, um, mm -hmm. or there's a whole plethora out there. So you know that's that's using things like LTI, building more mm -hmm. of that, building more of that tooling to just build a tighter integration, mm -hmm. build all that collaboration stuff, really expand on it. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at doing some white labeling stuff for publishers. So not so much for our bigger publishers, but for our smaller publishers that we often work with. Um, the, you know, we've got uh, coming up pretty soon. We've got what we call the White Store, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of our digital online. Um, marketplace mm -hmm. so from a publisher point of view they'll be able to go on there they have their own store they can sell all their content through their own through their own branded store there mm -hmm. that all syncs into my connect too and what they'll be able to do is for any users that have got set up there wow. um, they'll all already be all they'll all be set up it'll all be white labeled straight for whatever that whatever that publisher or resellers needs are mm -hmm. um, and we're potentially even looking at uh, expanding that so schools can even take advantage of that uh, system as well, which will be which will be really very, interesting very nice. and increasing automation within my connect. So as, as I said, a big thing for us is really making sure all of our schools are really uh, really happy and have easy lives. Um, and when you make things difficult for a school, you make things difficult for yourself um, in some ways. So the more we can automate within the system and we can let the schools control that journey as well, um, the better it off it is for the school. The less work we have to do, and a lot less work for the school as well. So the I think when we started, sort of the it was the high teens of people uh, on the system that were on digital e-readers. Now it's in the twenties that the market share. It's yep, so yep. and it's growing every year. And I, I can imagine just with the way that the world is 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 going, um, that immersive experience has got to expand. So what's what's next in that sort of area? Yeah. So a big thing for us will be our voice and video and getting that into the wow. platform. As well as some like just office documents, so that allows you know as you as a teacher to upload sort of whatever you want, however you want, yeah, yeah, yeah. share it with whoever you need, whether it's class notes or lesson plans or anything like that. Um, and the voice and video annotations, I think that'll be coming real handy because you can then just embed that information straight into the textbook. You can share it with whoever needs that information. So well, it's not a point here, but I know that collaboration is a big thing for Massive. learning going forward. Mm -hmm. We haven't listed at a point here, but it is something that I know you guys have put into the system as well. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that's continuing to progress. So our, our model at the moment is uh, for collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very, it's very, very quick. 
um, but it's also a little bit lightweight. So mm. we're looking at sort of what we can do to really expand that out um, over the next little while. And then, you know, you can see here we've got, we've got some plumbing work uh, that we, we need to do in, in the back end. Mm -hmm. um, so project this size, we're going to end up with some code depth, of um, regardless of how green, Greensfield it is. Mm -hmm. um, you have all your lessons learned as, as you go along in the project. So some of the things we're really looking at doing, which is where microservices is really, really helpful, is uh, I would think within the, in the next six months, we're probably going to re-architect out probably 90% of the microservices under the hood. But from a user perspective, it'll be fully backwards compatible. compatible. Yeah. There won't be any breaks. Our API gateway ensures that everything translates fine. We can create new microservices. We can use 5% of our users on a new microservice, see how they go on that. Um, which, will, which will be really handy. Yeah. And that, that's really going to help us um, mainly with our deployment strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the real things we're looking at that is really trying to make sure we can really nail down those zero downtime releases. Mm. Um, is sort of what we're looking for as well as multi-region support, something very hard to do if, you do, if you're not in the cloud. Um, yeah. So, you know, for instance, um, at the moment, a lot of the new, newer schools we're picking up are in WA specifically. Um, so we are potentially looking at, uh, you know, using data centers over in WA or if we go to the US, UK, data centers over there um, just to really uh, make sure that the system is as quick as it, as quick as quick and as powerful as it can be. And gonna, we're going to um, leverage some cool features and, or cool uh, techs um, of the uh, open source community or Azure, such as uh, Longstarkly or feature flagging, blue-green deployments to really help that uh, re-architecture of um, mm. uh, microservices and remodeling um, the, the, the domain to make it really domain-driven and flexible. Um, yeah, so the future is around and, the And you, did you mention there's some new schools? So it sounds like you, the boss must be happy speaking up with a few new clients? <laughs> yeah, um, I think pretty much every week I speak to him, he goes, can we get this done? Because I've just demoed it to a new school. <laughs> Um, and they want this feature. And, uh, of course, in the old platform, that would have been, okay, we'll, we'll get it done by the end of the year, we hope, fingers <laughs> crossed. Um, whereas now we're able to say, well, you, you let us know when, when they want to buy, when they want to sign up, and yep. um, we'll, we'll get it done. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a big call because, obviously, it's taken a year or a year and a half to get this system off the ground and get it yep. to this point. It's obviously a big costly exercise, but the fact is that you, as a – the number one market share in textbooks in Australia, you guys had to address because if you didn't adapt with the market, you would lose market share. Yeah. But now you're gaining, which is really, really exciting. And yeah. to that, the, the certainty on the roadmap of a SaaS product is very important. It's vital mm -hmm. um, to um, get a, a better adoptance by, on the market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Cool. So we're going to go into uh, a summary, which is obviously that uh, Campion Education moved uh the into their own system um i was got a, a oh, we were joking earlier that uh the product owner was uh giving um uh requirements up to the last minute and the february that this was launched was a stressful month as it, this thing was off and we got lots and lots of school kids uh logging on but uh we still some of us still have our hair yeah but I, look I, I can't imagine releasing a system as big as this having 500,000 users log in on that first day um, and not doing it in the cloud. I think to have, you know, to look at a traditional service architecture, um, I think we would have been really struggling to figure out what our load capacity would have been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, we, I'll admit that, that first day we got it wrong. Yeah. Um, it was the, the usage requirements were higher than we anticipated. Mm -hmm. And you know what? We got to fix it in about 10 minutes. Um, cool. Which cool. was a great, great outcome. And, yeah, other than a couple of itchy weeks at the start which everything getting up this has been a really successful project and mm. and now we should open it up to questions both online and anyone in the any questions guys and we'll look down uh to the chat screen as well from online people as well mm -hmm. so anyone got any questions uh before that um there's uh, another qr code which is specific for this talk you can ah. accumulate some points yes scan away guys scan away to the to the QR code and you can get some some uh, me bands uh, SSW drink bottles yeah or the uh, Google Hub I think it was yeah. there so we're going to look down in the, the chat yep so yeah, so a lot of it's focused on schools any plans in the future to take that even further 
So the question was, there was a, a question, the focus is on schools. Is there any plans to take it further? Yeah, so that's where if you look at uh, what's coming with our white store, that really opens it up to anyone and everyone, especially once we start considering, well, we're able to work with resellers and things like that. So traditionally as a company, yeah, we, we focus on the education market, predominantly secondary, but also primary um, and occasionally tertiary as well. Um, but yeah, so I don't see us as a company, at, the, at least at the moment, heading towards sort of outside of that education industry. We've got a lot of really good in-house knowledge about how our industry works, um, and we've still got a lot more learn, a lot more growing to do within it within our own industry. Um, but yeah, what we're looking for, in sort of, I guess, in the future with our platform is it's not dependent on you being in a school environment. So, you know, if we look at some of the white labeling stuff we are doing with publishers and resellers. Mm -hmm. We're not going to care whether you're selling to schools or to individual users or to uni students or to .NET user groups. Um, you'll be able to do it. So really, um, Kevin has now provided a platform and a toolbox of all the toolkits, and there will be more and more toolkits. And then, as a as a partner, as a as a as a like a vendor, you can use the toolkits, choose the toolkits to build your own cool stuff. Yeah, and yeah, obviously being able to do it all at scales really important to us wow. um so you know anyone who wants to use us uh, can be pretty confident that we're going to be able to handle uh whatever they throw at us any other questions yep uh testing wise so you mentioned what's the hits your the staging area how do you approach your user acceptance testing do you get good kids together, or you know, <laughs> how do you approach that? Yeah, so we've got a few different just methods. Quickly, we'll just, I'll just oh, yeah. repeat the test because we've got, I think we're going through this mic. How testing? So, how's it done? Um, yeah, so uh, throughout the system, we've got automated testing. So we're talking unit testing for all the back end and front end mm -hmm. components integration testing um, and as well as UI testing and that that's all automated and that runs on every single pull request we do so nothing gets into our master branch without it having gone through some fairly rigorous testing uh, on, on our side before that once it then lands in the dev environment um, usually there's a few devs who'll be looking at it um, so we have some devs like Patrick who like to do a lot of their development work against the development environment. So uh, Patrick will be changing something in the UI and he'll be using all the uh, cloud microservices there in the dev environment. So you'll we'll, be able to catch naughty boys. Um, like so we, 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 sometimes <laughs> catch it, we sometimes catch a few issues through that. Once we get it into the staging environment, um, we hand it over to, sort of to our internal IT testing team as well as uh, account managers, sales reps throughout the business. Um, so they're able to look at it from the point of view of uh, what do our customers want. So they jump in there, they do all that testing. Internally, we're sort of testing more probably more of the admin side of stuff, um, whereas our account managers uh, are really looking at looking at everything from from that student and school perspective. And that's where we've got things like uh, you know using Cordova with iOS and getting everything out onto test flight. We can push that out to schools if we have schools that need to do testing or we can get them uh, beta or even alpha builds of uh, the Electron app so they can really uh, get their teeth into something, some of the stuff around there. A lot of what we do though um, is, Patrick was talking about before, is feature flagging. So we will we'll build stuff and we release it, but we just don't turn it on. Um, so if we look at something like trial products, which mm -hmm. um, it's already in the production environment, but it's not quite turned on for everyone yet. There's still a little bit of testing and a little bit of tweaking uh, to go on that one. Mm -hmm. um, but once that's turned on, we don't need to do a deployment to get that out. It's say once everyone's sort of fairly happy with it, you know, we're often at that point, we've done a fair amount of testing in production. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we've made the call, we're going to turn it on. And, you know, initially we might turn it on for 10% of our schools and we'll reach out to them and say, hey, can we get some feedback? Um, and then, yeah, we'll just keep pushing that out to everyone as we go. That that's all configuration driven, and to, yep. and it really really uh, line up with um, Agile development methodology to mm. get feedback, get early feedback, and uh, we do retro and we fix the issues and we improve our products. Mm -hmm. Yep, in yep. iterations. Okay, any any other questions? Have we got any questions online? From I'm just looking down at the teams or from the YouTube chat. So that's where Microsoft. 
uh, at mercy of the reader comes in very, very handy. Oh, so, nice. Um, from, from a development point of view, we didn't have to do all that much. All the hard stuff, so to speak, was taking care of it uh, for us. And what's really good about a mercy of reader is as a student, you can listen to it in your own language if you want. Ah, nice. Wow. So, I, I, Do they have gibberish? Uh, <laughs> So if you, some of the languages, if you select, uh, if you select Polish or something like that, it probably sounds like gibberish to me. But oh. well, the, the chap that asked is, uh, I think he's Serbian, or he's from that part of the world. But so yeah, that'd be interesting. That uh, yep. especially with Australia, that's really important to be able to support multiple languages. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, any other questions? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, great question. So the question came is how was change management mm. and the cutover from one system to the other? Uh, it, it was a lot. Um, I think I probably spent about a week just developing a plan and we had in terms of this plan um, mm. specific things that were going out at specific times and then certain tests that were also happening at certain times just to make sure we ticked all of those boxes. Um, once we'd done that, however, we actually kind of, we, we had it in the production environment quite a while before we actually uh, needed to go live, so to speak. So it was sitting there in production. It just wasn't advertised. We didn't have uh, DNS mappings for it and all, all that kind of fun stuff. So um, one of the major things we did is because our old platform, because um, it is a, a leased platform, we can't go in there and change our code. Um, and I really don't think they would have appreciated it if we turned around and said, hey, can you uh, update your software to just redirect everyone to ours? That'd be great. Um, so uh, we, we, we sort of looked at it from a DNS perspective and we just sort of had anyone who was hitting those, uh, hitting those name servers um, were then just redirected to, uh, to the new domain names. So it was, it was a piece of functionality we had in the old system where schools could have custom domain names. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it might be uh, school A at dot campion dot education. Mm -hmm. um, however, it was a real pain to set up in the old system. It was a lot of manual handling. It was, uh, you know, some of the infra infrastructure guy going into it, in, going into DNS and for every single one of those records, creating a record, pointing it there, waiting till it would have propagated, changing config settings. And there was, you know, usually a day or two of downtime um, as part of that cutover. Um, with the with my connect to what we've done is all of anything going to campion.education any of the subdomains always point um straight to that azure, azure cluster mm -hmm. and azure's got its own name service so it's able to serve everything up and then based on the domain that you hit we always know what context of what school you're in so for us to now set up a school for a custom domain name again it's it's 30 seconds uh compared to two days so wow well, that's 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 pretty cool any other questions For how far has the implement has the implementation drifted from the initial design? Great question. Uh, I think I know who asked it too. Is it who? <laughs> uh, <laughs> he, I think he was. Yeah, he did he, some of the original spec. He did. Um, yeah. So quite substantially, actually. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So if you if look, if you would actually look at the UI design, the UI design itself hasn't changed. But what the system can do underneath the hood, especially in terms of integration and automation, has evolved very significantly. Um, it's probably was probably I think our biggest pain point was mm. um, we thought we were building system A and we ended up building system B, B yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. instead. And if we'd known that maybe from the get go, uh, we probably would have gotten it done a little bit a little bit quicker with a little bit less pain. Um, but regardless, we still got there in the end. Um, and look, some of that was due to we built the system based on how we did things in the old system. So how we did user management in the old system, oh, well, let's do the same thing in the new system. Mm. And then, oh, maybe we shouldn't just do what we've always done. Maybe there is a better way. Um, For instance, I remember to. there was a good example. In the, in the old system, when I trying to uh, create a school license, which is a model that they can allocate the, the license to a school, but well, from administration perspective, they have to duplicate that license. So uh, along the way, while we develop a new system, we completely remove that pine, we simplify the model. Mm -hmm. um, and because it's been domain driven, we really um, reflect what the uh, admin users and the, the uh, campaign support will actually do so that we simplify the logic. So yep. there was a lot of you know change along the way. That's 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 why Agile or Scrum has been so useful in mm. big, big compliments to the management 
uh, who uh, saw the vision and it yeah. did go all over the place and uh, they they stuck with it and they were really, really supportive through the process yeah. and um, the product is a uh, testament to all yeah. you and the team I, at Campion. I wouldn't hesitate to say that best in the world at the moment. Oh, no, you guys are. Uh, because it's interesting with the Kindles and Apple e-readers and all that sort of stuff, it's a very fixed ecosystem, whereas you guys have to live in a really, really weird environment, don't you? Yeah, no, obviously the big thing, complexity in education really came back to customization. So pretty much everything in the platform is customi is customizable. It has to be. Mm -hmm. um, from how schools integrate with this to how students log in to how the platform looks and how it works and how it reacts and how then kids then get access to publishers. And, um, you know, I, I think probably two years ago, I tried to write a document that kind of outlined all the different um, ways we do things with a school. Mm -hmm. um, and after about 20 pages, um, I just went, yeah, look, I think I've gotten about 80%. Yeah, yeah that's still pretty good. Yeah. So the, the strategic and visionary uh, plan uh, from the, the management and the leadership team really help us in the engineering process. Mm. And uh, because MC2 is, is very, very much kids and school or end user driven, so that's why it's been adopted and been uh, getting a lot of good feedback from the users. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. no, no, no. A big, yeah. big compliments to the management team because they did, uh, I mean, we, we had some uh, really key people that uh, that understood what the market needed and they, they've had a really big say in some of the design. Uh, but, uh, well, yeah. it's, it's all testament and to Yeah, it. I think at the end of the day, the product we've got is the best and um, that really, really shows. Fabulous. Any other questions before we, we wrap up tonight from online? Uh, no, I think we're all good. So from uh, SSW, we firstly would like to thank Alexander Candy Levy from <laughs> Camping Education to come and talk to us about the education in the cloud. Yep. Uh, it's been, a, gosh, 18, 19 months. Patrick and I started the journey. And other SSW people started the journey. And gosh, the product is amazing and all testament to you. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. All right. Thanks for having me. No problems at all. <laughs> thanks, guys.